This is Suzuki part number 59300-45811 and this is 59306-45020. They may look different, but they have a few things in common. Both are worn and pitted, in need of replacement. Both belongs to a GS550 from 1978 and they are both discontinued. It's no longer possible to buy these. Therefore, in this video, we're making brake parts. The material of choice is stainless steel. It's corrosion resistant, very durable, perfect for our needs. However, the fact that it's durable also makes it a very tough material to work with. The lathe I got is very light. It's great for when I need to move it, I can just pick it up and carry it. But it does not have the rigidity nor the power for a job like this. Needless to say, this will be quite a challenge. We'll start by cutting the material to length, two hacksaw blades and a lot of character later, and we can shock our work up in the lathe and face it. The first turning operation, here we go. Wow, that did not sound good. Let's do the only logical thing, completely ignore that and move on to something else. Instead, we'll try to cut the outside diameter of the thread. I don't have a lot of allowance in my stock, it's less than 0.2mm larger than my part, so we'll have to dial it in carefully. During the initial cuts, it's not turning great. The lathe is singing the song of its people. When I'm getting close to my target, I'll switch to some emery paper for a good finish and an accurate dimension. Next up is this smaller step. I tried a couple of different cutters. My turning and facing tool is not performing well. The chamfering tool is, but I'm bringing out my secret weapon here. A boring bar flipped in its holder. This has saved me many times with this lathe. I think it's performing well since it's a small insert made for smaller cuts that I'm taking. I also bet that the cutting pressure is really low, which is key when turning on a small machine. Now for the long diameter of the pin. This is really difficult since the lack of rigidity uh, along with the long stickouts is basically guaranteeing a massive taper. On top of that it's a lot of material to remove. I'm taking 0.1mm depth of cuts, so I'll be here a while. I managed to turn it down to this, and then I swapped over to the emery paper again, to try to get rid of the taper and get down to the target. It took a long time to end up with a passable result. But now we're really in trouble. It's time for the potting tool and there is no way that this will work out well. I'm referencing this shoulder, then I'm moving to the end of the pot to make a groove for the hacksawing later. Then it's time for the o-ring grooves. It isn't cutting per se, I'm more forcing the tool into the material until there is enough pressure to take a cut. I'm suggesting it to take a chip with more and more pressure until it decides to do so. And it's very hard to get a good result and hit an accurate dimension. But let's move on and cut the thread. The brass ring I'm using to shake the threads, I made myself along with an internal cutting tool. There's a video linked in the description if you're interested. When the ring fits nicely, we can remove the work from the chuck and cut off the leftovers with the hacksaw. And then we can cut in the chamfer at the end. Now we've reached the unavoidable, the 8mm hex at the end of the pin. I have no means of cutting one of those here in my garage. I would need a rotary brooch, I could make one, 
but I don't really like the idea of spending a few weeks on a side project like that. I need to finish my motorcycle. There is always the option to buy, but a good one that will fit my lathe is likely to be expensive and I don't really want to buy a cheap one. Nor do I want to wait a long time for something to be shipped to me. One could just slit the end with the angle grinder and use a flathead screwdriver to tighten it, but I don't really like that idea. It's too pretty of a part for that. But I have an idea that is so crazy that it just might work. This is Loctite 648. It has a strength of more than 25 newtons per square millimeters. According to my quick calculations, this insert will hold up to at least 32 newton meters of torque. So, let's test that. Five, 10, 15, 20. And the baby torque wrench is defeated. Shame on you. Let's bring out the big one. 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 50, 50 newton meters. I'm gonna call that good enough for my purposes. There is no torque spec for these pins. I lightly torque them to around 15 to 20 newton meters, and 50 is more than two times the margin. But yeah, this may come back to bite me at a later date. Drilling stainless steel is one of the most terrifying things you can do. I barely got it done. Here is what seemed to work for me. Slow speed to keep things cool. Liberal amounts of cutting oil. Drill a little bit, take a break, rinse and repeat. Be decisive, high pressure while drilling and quick retractions when you stop. Avoid rubbing at all costs. The inserts are turned with a clearance of a few hundredths of a millimeter and a crisscross pattern made by a threading tool. We are basically done with the, this part now. But how did we do dimensionally? It's time to inspect. I made two of these pins and here are the results. The grooves were really the most challenging on these. I buggered up the thread on pin number one I think it was due to that I started to thread into a hard shoulder. On the second pin, I chamfered either end of the threads before I started. Anyhow, I had to go much deeper with the threading tool before I got a good fit with my brass threading ring. The outside diameter is still nominal, but I can feel that the crest of the thread is really narrow. It's almost sharp. Now for the piston. It seems like a very complicated geometry for a brake piston. There's an external dome on top, as well as a cavity in the back. I really want to replicate this, because one of the stock pistons is in a good condition and I plan to use it. And the behavior on the right and left side for the brakes needs to be the same. So we're copying this geometry as best we can. This is a 40mm solid rod of stainless steel. And this is a hacksaw. It's times like these when you're pondering if there are other hobbies. Knitting perhaps? Fishing seems relaxing? Growing your own vegetables? Once again we dial in the work, this time to reduce imbalance in the setup. Then again we try to face this part, and this part requires a lot of facing operations, and this lathe simply cannot do it. I tried all my different turning tools, I locked the cross slide, I tried to take two hundredths of a millimeter passes, and it's still shattering like crazy. The boring tool was the one that showed the most promise, until I broke that insert, and I gave up. Once again we'll ignore that problem and deal with it later. Instead, let's try to get an accurate OD with intolerance, and we'll cross the facing bridge later. Just like last time, I'm turning a taper. But if you can measure your taper, you can take additional partial passes to reduce the amount of lapping that needs to be done. I mean, the emery paper will surely even out these steps before we reach the target dimension, right? Uh, nope. How about that fishing trip, eh? After a good night's sleep, it's pretty clear that we have a couple of problems to deal with. If I can't do a simple facing operation, then I cannot make this part. Based on the chatter marks, it seems like the work is moving axially, 
and I have an idea how to fix that. While we're at it, we'll make a few other improvements. I'm making a solid tool post to replace the compound slide when I'm not using it. The only material I had on hand that was large enough is aluminium. I would have preferred steel. It's important to replicate the height of the compound so I don't have to adjust the height of my tools when I'm switching between them. Parallelism between the two faces is very important. Other than that, the most interesting operation on this part is probably boring the flat bottom on the counterbore for the fasteners. I'm using a small end mill for that and it worked fine in aluminium. This is a spacer. I'm making it out of steel but with an acetal core since I do not have a steel pipe in the correct size. This is a replacement for the fully plastic spacer in the spindle preload assembly. The plastic spacer can probably compress a bit under load. That won't happen with the steel spacer, so it will decrease the possibility of axial play. The last and most significant modification is replacing the ball bearings in the spindle with a pair of angular contact bearings. These will handle the axial load much better. I've had these laying around for a while. I bought them along with some other equipment and I never got around to swapping them in. You know how it goes. By the way, if anyone is wondering, this is not the proper way to rebuild a machine spindle. But then again, perhaps it is the proper way to rebuild a mini lathe spindle. Now we're back in action and the difference is night and day. I am very pleased with the facing I'm able to do now. I can't really take a massive depth of cut, but then again, this is stainless steel and it's really tough stuff. This is the surface before the modification and this is after. Now let's try to hit that outer diameter for the piston. The problem isn't really hitting the dimension itself. The problem is leaving just enough material so you can polish out the tool marks for a flawless surface and still be within tolerance without leaving too much material so you would have to spend your life in front of the lathe with an emery cloth slowly sanding away towards a dimension far far away. This time I left about 40 micron on the diameter and it turned out to be a good amount. I polished the surface up to 1200 grit. Higher would have been nice but I did not have any finer on hand. I ended up 10 microns below the upper service limit of the piston and 15 microns above the lower so that's perfect. Now it's time for grooving and it's not any less scary this time. It performed a little bit better than before the modifications, but yeah, parting in stainless steel is still not a pleasant experience on a lathe like this. I'm also putting a groove at the end of the part as a guide for the hacksawing later. Next up is the cavity at the bottom of the piston. And this means that I have to drill again, let me tell you. I need to buy a new set of drills after these projects for sure. Long story short, I managed to drill up to 12 millimeters. When I went in with number 13, I made a mistake and the material work hardened. There is no way I'm getting through that without carbide now. Then I swung the compound over the correct amount and started to cut in the cavity. This took hours. The compound is really one of the weak points on this lathe. I could only take very light cuts. Eventually though, with the help of a cordless drill, I got to the bottom of it, literally. Before we break down this setup, we'll add some chamfers, radii and deburr the part as best we can before we return to the hacksaw to pay our respects. I really need to get a bandsaw or a powered hacksaw. Doing this by hand is incredibly dull. Now we turn the part around and dial it in for concentricity. I'm using a piece of soda can here to protect the outer diameter from getting marred by the jaws. The first operation is a simple diameter. Now we only have one feature left to make, but it's an interesting one. The dome on top of the piston. First we'll face the piston to final height, including the dome. Then I'm following a pre-made table on the drawing. It consists of 13 facing cuts of 100 microns each, all to different diameters. And as you can see, I'm building the dome geometry incrementally. Once all 13 cuts has been made, it looks like a dome. 
But in order to finish it off, I have to resort to files and emery cloth to smoothen out the steps. As you can see, we managed to replicate the old brake piston rather well. We'll carefully test the braking system once we got the bike up and running to make sure that we have something that works correctly. Now here are all the parts. The lathe, while cheap and Chinese, got the job done. Not particularly quick or painless, but I started with raw materials and now I have motorcycle parts, which is what matters. I'm going to start to assemble my brakes with these components right away, so I suggest that you check it out by watching this video of the complete rebuild of the brakes. Thank you!